and welcome back. And today we're working on my vacuum tube computer. Not this one, this one that hangs on the wall. This is the UE1. It is a one bit vacuum tube computer based very heavily on the Motorola MC14500 minimal ICU system. The Motorola chip, the MC14500, is a one bit industrial control unit. Now, a lot of people get confused when I call it a one bit CPU or a one bit processor because they go, well, it's got a four bit instruction. How can that possibly be a one bit computer? Well, data comes into the system and leaves the system one bit at a time. The data bus width is one single bit. Regardless of everything else that's happening, when data comes in one bit and leaves one bit at a time, that is a single bit processor. But it is not a bit slice processor. It's not designed in such a way that you can stack multiple ones of these up next to each other to get a wider bit width. It is literally a one bit processor, which sounds incredibly useless, but Motorola originally designed the chip to be used in industrial situations, uh, particularly like stoplight controllers. And so for that, it works really well. But uh, because of that, it wasn't really set up very well for general computing. It only has a logic unit on it. So I did make a little modification to the uh, vacuum tube version that we built over here, and it's got a full-fledged arithmetic logic unit. So we can do addition and subtraction. Granted, we're only doing it one bit at a time. Now, this left half here is just the processor. This is the equivalent of the Motorola MC14500 IC, not the entire minimal IC use system. As a matter of fact, I actually built up the uh, minimal ICU system on its own dedicated board here. I have an entire video about this and uh, I think it's pretty cool. The Motorola chip hangs out right here in the middle. Everything else in here is just the supporting ICs and circuitry that is required to build out the minimal ICU system. So if this board is just the equivalent of this one IC, that means everything else has to fit on this single board. That seems ludicrous and insane, but we are doing some tricky things to make sure that can happen. For example, the ROM here that stores all of the uh, programs that run, we're gonna be using a paper tape reader for it. And that actually simplifies things dramatically because now we don't need a program counter and programs can be of any arbitrary length. So we actually have a little more functionality going on there. But also, the Motorola chip is fantastically complex compared to everything else. Now, when I started building this, uh, I really didn't have a direction, but last year, I finally came up with a finalized plan for how I wanted to build it out, and we started working on it, and my goal was to have the entire UE1 finished and executing code by the end of 2023. And we did not make that deadline. Not even close. <laughs> <laughs> we're digging deep into 2024 here and it still looks pretty sparse and I haven't done an update on this in quite a while, but that doesn't mean that I've been ignoring it. I've actually been working pretty hard behind the scenes to cut out a mass of PCBs. So today what I wanna do is solder all of these up and that will finalize the logic portion of the UE1. All that remains after that is building the paper tape reader and starting to test running code. So we're getting pretty close to finishing. It'll definitely be finished in 2024. I'm aiming for a lot sooner than the end of the year, but uh, the first step is getting these soldered up. So let's just hop to it. Because it's been a hot minute since we last did anything with the UE1, let's do a quick refresher on what it is we've built so far and where we're going. Uh, and we'll start by looking at the processor with this little block diagram right here. Uh, this is essentially the same as the original block diagram that was drawn for the Motorola MC14500, but you can see that there's a little bit of a difference right in the middle where we have our ALU, a carry register, and our result register. Having this carry register feed back into the ALU allows us to do essentially bit serial addition and subtraction. Uh, other than that though, it's a pretty simple setup. Now we have two interesting registers. We have an IEN and an OEN register. This is input enable and output enable. We don't have a way to jump in the program counter, particularly since we're using uh, paper tape for our programs. We don't have a way to rewind and do random access. So instead we just mask inputs or mask outputs and that allows us to skip blocks of code. So the processor we've actually already built, that is the 
full board on the left that is full of uh, vacuum tubes. This is the minimal ICU system. This is what we've been using as the blueprint for the total system that we're building. And you can see right in the middle, it shows the MC14500. This is our board that we've built. So everything else is what is remaining to be built, but it's all actually pretty simple. Starting at the top, we have two four-bit counters to give an eight-bit memory address. That eight-bit memory address is fed into a ROM that gives an eight-bit value out. All of that is being replaced by the paper tape. Now the eight bits that comes out of that ROM, four of them go to the processor, that's our four bit instruction, and the other four snake around and go to the three blocks here on the bottom. On the far left here, we have system inputs. This is nothing really fancy, this is just external inputs coming into a uh, selector. And we've actually already built this up on the boards over there. We have seven toggle switches right at the top. The block in the middle is our system outputs and our scratch bits. Now we're not actually using this block as system outputs on the vacuum tube version that we're building. So we're only using this as a scratch register. And scratch means that we can write to it and read back from it. This is our random access memory, but there's only eight bits in it. So we only have uh, one byte of RAM. So one byte of RAM on our one bit computer. Now the block on the far right is system outputs. This is write only memory. We can't read anything that we write to this back into the system, but uh, anything that's external can actually see what was written there. And so that actually raises an interesting question. We have essentially eight inputs, eight outputs, and uh, eight bits of scratch register. That comes out to a total of 24 bits. How are we addressing 24 bits with just a four bit memory address? Well, we're using the write pin and whether the write pin is asserted or not changes which ones we're addressing. It's pretty clever. And we've got pretty much all of this built. We've got the processor built, we've got inputs built, scratch bits, and outputs built. So all that's left is to build up all the glue logic. And I have a full logic diagram of the entire thing that we're building. Everything is included on this with the exception of the clock because we have a weird two-phase clock and the input coming in from the paper tape. I'll put a link to this in the description below if you wanna play around with the Logisim file. And we've actually built pretty much all of this, but if we've built all of that and we've got all the major components on the board, why do I still have like eight PCBs here that need uh, soldering up? Well, like what are, what are these doing? Um, well, some of them have vacuum tube sockets on them. Those are pretty interesting, but a lot of them are just moving signals from one place to the other. So what I wanna do is solder all of these up. And as I get each one soldered up, I'll uh, update you guys and show you what exactly it looks like after it's soldered up. We'll test it out and then bolt it to the board. Soldering these up was definitely one heck of an undertaking. They look pretty unassuming, but there was a lot of work to be done here. So I just got my laptop set up and connected to the voice chat on the Discord server and had an absolute blast chatting with everyone while I was making little Hershey kisses of molten metal which I suppose is a good segue to mention that the modern day internet has riddled us with so many choices for communication that it's actually too many. I've had people try to contact me through email, YouTube comments, text messages, Facebook messenger, Google chat, Discord, LinkedIn, Hackaday messages, Skype, Line, Twitter, or X or whatever it's called now. And honestly, it's just too many different services to keep up with. The absolute best way to get in touch with me is through Discord. The Usagi Electric server is a public server and there is a join link in the description of every video. Join the server and ping me or shoot me a message and I will get back to you. Any of those other services for contacting me, well, you may get a response whenever I remember that they exist and check them, but it's often quite a long time in between. Uh, anyways, hope to catch you on the Discord. Back to the action. Well, that took way longer than I thought it would. It took like two full days to solder all these up. Just looking at it here, it doesn't actually look like that much, but all of the jumper wires take a ton of time to uh, bend correctly and solder in place. And there's just a massive number of connections on the edges to connect the boards to each other. There's probably over a thousand solder connections on these boards, and that's 
a lot. Uh, but anyways, it's all soldered up. They're ready to go onto the board or get tested. And I've actually got it split into two halves here. Uh, this half on the right needs to be tested. I need to put power into these and make sure that they work. This half on the left uh, doesn't need to be tested for reasons that are probably painfully obvious looking at them. There's no components on them. They are simply just boards for moving signals from one location to another. Just an evil necessity of building something in the form factor that I'm building it. So let's go ahead and put all of these onto the board, get them out of the way, and then we can sit down and test these boards over here and make sure that everything's working. This piece on the top left is used to bring the 8-bit instruction word from the paper tape out to a header for easy access. Then these two long pieces down the side take the memory address part of that instruction word and move it down towards the bottom of the board where the memory is. They also have some power headers for any paper tape logic that may be needed. Over on the top right, these boards have a ton of signals on them. Mostly though, it's input signals going down and back. The toggle switches on the top need to get all the way down to the addressing logic on the bottom. There they get mixed with external inputs and then the selection logic picks the correct input and drops it onto the data bus. On the bottom right down here, the memory also receives selection logic signals coming from the very same place as the input selection logic. And that's all the boring boards, even though that alone made a massive difference. That's already looking absolutely amazing. I am, I'm starting to get real excited watching this thing come together. There's only five more PCBs to put on there and then it'll be pretty much complete. But before we go bolting these up there, I want to test them here on the bench individually to make sure that they're working correctly. So that way when we plug everything together, we know that we don't have an individual fault. We just know that we have design faults or other bad ideas going on when it doesn't <laughs> work. Uh, but we're going to start with this board right here. This looks like an incredibly simple board and it is. It's just two cathode follower buttons. Buffers. Should be very easy to test this. But before we test it, what are we buffering with these cathode follower buffers? Well, I have the memory set up in a pretty interesting way on this machine. Each bit of memory, both for the scratch register and the output register, is essentially a D flip-flop. And there is address selection logic at the beginning of that D flip-flop for writing a value into it. And there's address selection logic at the end of that flip-flop for reading what that value was later. So whatever we're using to select a specific bit has to be able to drive those two uh, inputs of that D flip-flop. But it actually gets a little worse than that because I have my memory set up as essentially a two by eight bit grid. And I'm using two X select lines and eight Y select lines. Now the eight Y select lines only have to drive four inputs total, but the X select lines have to drive 16 inputs total each. That is too much for the select line to handle. So we gotta buffer it up and make it nice and strong so that the uh, draw on it doesn't pull it down to a useless value. And that's all this board is doing. Just two simple little cathode follower buffers. So all we really need to do is put some power into these and then put a high level input into one and see what the output looks like. Should be a pretty easy one to test. To test this PCB, I've just got a little breadboard here with uh, plus 24 ground and minus 12 on jumper wires coming to power this. And uh, then the inputs are these uh, two wires here that go to these push buttons that have 33k ohm pull-ups to 24 volts. Then I've got this beautiful HP 3476B digital multimeter that I got from Philip. Thank you so much. I've got it hooked up to one of the outputs down here. The other output's going to be on this white wire. So I think this should work. Uh, if I've got everything plugged into the right place at least. So we'll go ahead and flip the power switch here. It's going to take the tubes just a little bit of time to warm up fully. And yeah, it looks like we're starting to warm up. You can see the voltage here is climbing up beyond uh, 0.8 volts, 0.9 volts, 1 volt. That's what I'm expecting as a logic low coming out of a cathode follower buffer. So let's push one of the buttons and uh, see if we can get this up to over 20 volts here. Yeah, there we go. 24 volts. Uh, that's actually a little suspiciously good. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm reading that wrong. Uh, or maybe that's just awesome. Uh, okay, so let's try this one here. 1.68 volts. 
Push the button, 24.1 volts. That is suspiciously good out of both of those, but uh, the other button doesn't affect it. And yeah, I mean, hey, maybe we just got some excellent 6AU6s on there. Uh, I'm not gonna look a gift horse in the mouth. That <laughs> is awesome. All right, so that looks like it's working perfectly. Next up, this little board right here, and it looks a lot more complex, but actually it's, it's pretty much exactly the same, just two cathode follower buffers. So what are these two cathode follower buffers buffering that the previous two weren't? Well, this is on the complete opposite end of the memory. So we have uh, eight bits of memory for our scratch register. And each of those eight bits essentially goes into a massive OR gate on the way out to eventually feed back into the data bus. Now the data bus feeds into a massive number of inputs all over the system. So whatever that output that is asserting the data bus is, it needs to be nice and strong. So we're just taking whatever comes out of the memory that's supposed to make it to the data bus and we're running it through a simple cathode follower buffer to make it nice and strong so that it can hopefully drive the data bus across the entire system. These two cathode follower buffers are just buffering separate inputs onto a combined data bus output. So we actually have two different inputs here, just like before we've got our two push buttons with 33K ohm pull-ups, but we only have one output to check and that's the combined data bus. So uh, we don't need to move our lead around. So we'll go ahead and flip the power switch on here. Uh, we should see the tube start warming up. And just like before, we're seeing the uh, logic low out of these cathode follower buffers come up above one volt. That's kind of where I'm expecting it to sit until I push a button. So we'll go ahead and push a button. Either button should give us plus 24 volts on the data bus here. Yeah, 23 and a half volts and 22.9 volts. That's actually uh, really good because that tells me that the two cathode follower buffers are behaving slightly differently. So we can see that we don't have a short going on and just one cathode follower buffer feeding both. So that's awesome. So <laughs> those two cathode follower buffers are working perfectly, although not as suspiciously perfectly as the previous two. Although I did test those again and they're working excellently. So that's awesome. That's all going smoothly now. Next is this little board right here, and you guessed it, more cathode follower buffers. There's, there's a bit of a recurring theme here, and that is that we have a lot of signals that aren't quite strong enough to make it on the data bus. And this one pretty much does the exact same thing as the last one, except it's doing it for the input register instead of the scratch or output register. The input register is interesting because it's not really a register. It's actually toggle switches or external inputs coming from outside of the system. So we have to have a bit of logic in there to essentially override the toggle switch depending on what the external input is. So the fact that we are actually able to take external inputs means that now the signal that we're trying to assert to the data bus is not going to be strong enough, so we have to buffer it. Again, exact same construction as the cathode follower buffers that we've seen up to now, so it should be pretty easy to power up and confirm. Now, both of these cathode follower buffers here are actually completely in parallel. They have the same input coming into them and they have the same output going out of them, so I don't actually know how to test them separate of each other, so we're just gonna test them together. Uh, I just have the input on a, a single little button here, 33K ohm pull up to 24 volts, and then I have the output here uh, uh, hooked up to our voltmeter. So I'll go ahead and flip the power switch on. There we go, it looks like the tubes are starting to warm up. We have an output of about one volt or so. If I push the button here, we should see 20 some odd volts. Yeah, there we go, 22 volts. Uh, 1.6 volts, 22 volts, 1.6 volts. That's working perfectly, excellent. No more cathode follower buffers, I promise. Those were the last of them. <laughs> now we're getting into stuff that's a lot more interesting and exciting. And uh, we're gonna test this panel next, which is gorgeous. It has two IV26 VFDs on it, or vacuum fluorescent displays. And well, that's it. That's all it's got on it. Doesn't have anything else, no logic or anything like that, just the display. So. 
what are these displaying? Well, the way that we built our output register, we actually had to change it up a bit compared to the scratch register. So we had to get a parallel read of all eight bits in the output register to put on a header so that something external to the system could use it. But it means that we have eight bits of buffered output floating around on the board. So I wanted blinking lights. I wanted more flashing lights on it, and what better way than to hook those eight bits of parallel output from the output register up to some VFDs so we can see exactly what the output register is storing. So this should be a fairly easy board to test. These VFDs are unknown. I salvaged them from something else, but uh, it should be pretty easy to test because we just got to throw a little bit of power into it and then put a uh, high level on any of the eight inputs. So I'm pretty excited about this one. To test this board, we don't actually need our voltmeter anymore because we have visual indicators. That's, that's the whole purpose. That's the whole point. Uh, but this is the one that I'm actually the most nervous about because uh, I didn't have the exact correct uh, drop-down resistors for the filaments, so I kind of had to make do out of this parallel arrangement. This should be totally fine, but I don't actually know. The only way to know for sure is to flip the power on and see how it goes. So, whew, here goes nothing. Uh, nothing, nothing blew up at least. Um, I'm not expecting any of the lights to come on until I push a button. I've got all of the eight inputs hooked up to uh, little toggle switches here. Let's go ahead and push a button and see if something lights up. Yeah, <laughs> yes. There we go. That's awesome. That's the four bits that are coming in from here. And that's the four bits that are coming in from there. So we have all eight of our bits right there <laughs> yes oh that's cool that's gonna look epic the final board that we need to test is this one right here which is probably the most colorful and also the most complex but this one has absolutely nothing to do with the logic of the machine this is simply a soft start for the 24 volt rail only now, I designed most of this to work by powering the filaments off of either the plus 24 volt rail or the minus 12 volt rail. And we're also using plus 24 volts as our B plus, and it allows me to optimize the layout of the PCBs. But also it means that I'm building a vacuum tube computer at incredibly low plate voltage, which is pretty cool. For the uh, memory and uh, punch side or paper tape reader side that we're building now, I tried to keep it almost entirely groups of four. Vacuum tubes, when they're cold, the filaments have incredibly low resistance. You have to get some heat in them for the resistance to come up. So we need some way to limit that inrush current, and that's exactly what this board is doing here. When you first turn the power on, you have 24 volts coming in, and it goes through this uh, 100 watt, one ohm resistor before it goes out to everything else. That's gonna drop a lot of voltage across it, and it's gonna limit the total amount of current that we can supply. Then as the 2D21 thyrotrons here start to warm up, they will start to conduct. And when they do, they will uh, conduct into the coil of the relay here, which will kick it off that then shunts across this resistor over here. So we get a straight 24 volts through the relay onto the power rails and everything is then fully powered up. Now, a lot of people have left comments previously that these type of resistors need a heat sink on them to function correctly. But since the resistor is only seeing power for about six to seven seconds, however long it takes for the 2D21 thyrotrons to warm up, it, yeah, it does get warm, but then it's left to just kind of cool off on its own over the next couple of hours because the only other time that it would see power is after we switch the machine off and then switch it back on again. And uh, the other two on the processor side have been fine after a year, so I'm pretty sure this one's gonna be okay. This is probably the least exciting one to check because unless we have a massive load on the 24 volt rail, we can't really check to see if it's uh, running through the one ohm or shunting across it or not. But all we really care about is if the relay kicks off. The layout should be good otherwise. And in order for the relay to kick off, that means that uh, both of these two, two D21 thyrotrons have to warm up and their filaments are coming off of minus 12. So everything kind of has to be working in order for that relay to click. So let's flip the power switch here and the relay should click as soon as those two D21s warm up.
There it went. It clicked right off. That was maybe six, seven seconds. That's awesome. So that should be working, I think. That's awesome. Now that is a massive milestone. That is all of the logic for UE1 complete. Everything has been confirmed to be working independently. Now we just gotta make sure it all works together. Now we're not quite ready to put power into it yet. Uh, you may notice that all of the boards are in place, but they're not all connected to each other. And that's because I have to make a bunch of uh, little boards like this that have uh, little connectors on them. And I've made about uh, eight of these, but I got about 12 more of them to cut out. So that's something that I'm gonna work on behind the scenes because these are incredibly boring to watch get made. <laughs> and then the next time we come back around to this, we can start tackling what remains. So what does remain? Well, uh, aside from those little pieces, we need to first of all test that the entire thing powers up and then test that this plays nicely with this because right now they're two completely separate systems. So we need to make a completely new harness. And then if we wanna build a new remote control, that new remote control would plug in right up here. But instead of doing that, I think we're just gonna dive straight into the paper tape. So that's gonna be an interesting challenge. I've never built a paper tape reader from scratch and that's something that I definitely wanna try with this. But uh, we're, <laughs> we're making pretty awesome progress here. This looks absolutely stunning and I am really amped up for this project now because we're so close. I can see the finish line. So I wanna thank you guys so much for watching and tagging along with me on this extremely long journey we've been on and I hope to see you in the next episode.